Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a great guest on a very important subject, and we have a lot of questions and a lot of ideas. We've been looking at Web3 and what that might mean for some time. In fact, we've been looking at it since it was before Web3. Uh, we've been trying to think about it in terms of this massive overlap. On the one side, you have virtual reality. On the other side, the decentralized web of blockchain and Bitcoin and all that good stuff. How does this work? What does it mean for higher education? How does an academic engage with all this? And should we? Well, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Michael Cohen. He's known as the tech rabbi, and he does a lot of great work with helping people be creative, helping them learn together and be productive together. And he is a Web3 guru. Uh, he is someone I'm very, very excited to join. In fact, let me just bring him up on stage without any further ado. And also, let me just welcome his immense and splendid beard. Hello, Michael. Hi, how are you? It's great to be here. Great, good to see you. Good to see you. And in fact, just just to maximize our our hair suit appreciation, let me just get this maximum screen size. Where are you coming to us today from, Michael? So I am based uh, in Miami right now. Uh, longtime SoCal resident that just relocated oh. there in, in August. So coming from really good weather right now. Uh, yes, Miami Spring is really really nice before the humidity kicks in. Yes. yes. Well, I'm, 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 glad to, I'm glad to hear you. I'm glad to have you here. And we have all kinds of questions. But before we go further, we ask people to introduce themselves in a particular way. We like to ask people to explain what they're going to be doing for the next year. What are the big topics, the ideas, and the big projects that are top of mind for you? What are you going to be working on for 2022 and into 2023? I like that. So a big focus right now for myself and the work in Web3, uh, and it really is all about Web3. There was a, a big pivot for me uh, last June to really immerse myself and explore this space. And I'm right now at the point where I am uh, attempting to go all in on it. So we have two different uh, pretty significant projects that we are working on right now. The first is the ED3DAO. Uh, it is uh, the first DAO for educators by educators. And we are really looking at trying to reimagine not just what education looks like, but what does uh, the future of education companies look like? And how can educators uh, unite their skills, their expertise, their capacities to impact education at scale and to uh, be, be rewarded uh, in many ways for the efforts and, and the time that they put into that? We're also launching a project called Ed three educators NFT, which is going to be a uh, NFT token that will give educators and those that are passionate about educators uh, a opportunity to engage in three really important experiences. One being our Ed3 unconference in uh, what we're calling the Eduverse, a Web3 certification and upskilling for educators to not just be able to educate their students on the future of the internet, but to be able to actually become participants in the Web3 ecosystem that desperately, desperately needs educators that understand how to communicate information to others, especially mm -hmm. complex types of information. So those mm -hmm. are two huge projects. And then for me, on a, on a personal note, really trying to explore ways that Web3 can scale intentionally because I might be someone that is a believer of Web3, but only with intentionality. And so I am trying to actually um, dissuade people from wasting time and resources trying to be Web3 for Web3's sake. So that's a side, that's like a little, a little hobby of mine right now uh, in, in both education and in industry. Well, that sounds like an awful lot of work and uh, and great stuff. In the chat, people have shared uh, a couple of links already, which is terrific. Um, and uh, thank you. That sounds like a, a great mission for the next year. Uh, good luck. Good luck with all of that. Um, it may be that uh, March 2023, we bring you back uh, to follow up and see how things have gone. I love um, that. There are all kinds of questions um, that people are going to have. And let me just say, just, just to begin with, I'm going to ask uh, the tech rabbi a couple of basic questions to, to get all of you stoked and excited and thinking about this. Um, but then I'm going to get out of the way 
and this will this will be for you. Um, I guess my first question is, um, when I, I define Web three, I define it as having two parts together. One is, you know, the VR helmet, you know, the VR part of it, and the other is uh, blockchain, uh, the blockchain component to it. And I, I'm curious, in in your estimation, that is, does that match up with your understanding, or is it mostly on the blockchain side of it? I think it's both. The the virtual reality element of it uh, still needs some work. Uh, I don't I can't I don't know many people that spend six to eight hours a day uh, it, it, living, working in, in virtual reality. There's still a you know a a, a human uh, imbalance in in, in our uh, the way that we are virtually engaged but not quite physically engaged. That could lead to nausea, discomfort. Um, you know, dizziness and things of that nature. So that, like, we have to figure out how to solve that. Uh, there's also a serious equity issue, uh, just access. You know, does everybody have access to uh, a $300 headset? You know, even the the uh -huh. um, the Oculus Quest, which I think is, is $199. So cheaper price point, need high speed internet, need to have right. stuff to set up for your whole family, right? If, if everyone needs a headset. So we're, we're getting there. But I think there's other ways to experience metaverse without virtual reality. But mm. I think it is definitely a 50-50 a share between metaverse and blockchain. But it's really about access, experience, and ownership. Those are the three core areas of Web3 mm. that will probably change over time how we apply those. But those are the real core elements that are hopefully going to be different than uh, the Web 1 and Web 2 predecessors of the Internet. Well, this is a, a question that's come up in the chat already. Um, and Tom and Lisa and a few others have been uh, batting this back and forth. Uh, Hal Hopner is, uh, has uh, uh, come into this. Um, you, know, you define this as a combination of experience, access, and ownership. And right, does, doesn't Web 1.0 and also Web 2.0 give us? I mean, the Web has access to, obviously, huge numbers of people around the world. It provides quite an experience, uh, and people get to own different parts of it. Uh, I'm a personally a big fan of uh, Jim Groom's um, uh, hosting service, um, Reclaim Hosting. Um, I mean, it, it sounds. This is a, in many ways a provocative question. It sounds like we already have those three things. In other words, what, why why upgrade to Web three? What does that? How does that improve things? So there. There are elements of Web3 that are, are naturally going to have to be built off of Web1 and Web2 because we only have Web3 because we know what we did wrong in Web1 and Web2. So Web1 is just consumption, right? It was about organizing uh, the, the, the scope of human knowledge in a way that it could be accessible for all. Uh, and in, in some ways, uh, that was achieved. Uh, in other ways, uh, we do know that depending on where you live geographically, uh, your Google search will decide what type of information they are going to show you when you are searching the same type of query. Uh -huh. So there is a centralized control over the uh, access of the, the form of information depending on where you are, depending on your search history. Even just yesterday, I saw a colleague looking up something around TED Talks and I said, oh, you should check out this uh, TED Talk from Nancy Duarte. And he struggled to find it. And I wondered why. Oh, it's yeah. because my search history is tailored to the pattern of words and queries that I am constantly engaging in. So my yeah. search for this is different. And then ownership. We do not own as much of the internet as we think we do. My social media community is not owned by me. It's owned by Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube and Google. So they decide one day, you know, the tech rabbi, you've, you've given us 10, 11 years of, of time and content on Twitter, but for some reason, we're just not interested any longer in allowing you uh, to communicate on this platform. And 11 years of my community building, my idea sharing, uh, my exciting back and forth with people, sparking exciting conversations is gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that ownership piece is not necessarily about the, the vehicles in which we experience the information, but it's about owning our data, allowing our data to move around and be carried from site to site. My LinkedIn can't go to my YouTube. Uh, okay. Your Shindig can't go to your YouTube without many different processes and permissions 
from these centralized entities that decide how, when, and why information should be existing, public, and transported to wherever it needs to be. So I would say right now we're honestly in web 2.1. Uh, we're on our web two devices, on our web two apps talking about web three. We're not in web three yet. Web three still will take some time, but it's really about looking at ways in which immersive experiences where people have control over where they go, what they do with their data, and how they're able to uh, control that information through blockchain technology is what really will usher in Web3. So blockchain is really, so one major takeaway is that blockchain is, uh, is, is, the, is the key here um, in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, that uh, you're pointing out that one of the problems is of course that these giant platforms, which we are, we are dependent on, um, uh, are of course independent of us and they can do uh, whatever they like. Uh, and I'm sure we've all experienced this kind of uh, uh, you know, problem before. Um, we have, uh, uh, just friends, we have a whole bunch of questions and comments uh, in, in the chat from great folks, uh, uh, Hal Hepner, uh, Jonathan Parts, uh, Simone Ravioli. Um, I'm sorry, Simone, if I mispronounced it, uh, Ravioli. Um, and of course, the excellent Maria Anderson. Um, if you'd like to, uh, um, if you want me to hoist one of those questions up, I can do it, but also just type it in the Q&A box or join us on stage. Those are the best ways. And um, uh, just to get things uh, get things rolling even further, I'm going to bring my good friend uh, Tom Hames up on stage, and we will try, as polite gentlemen, not to make fun of his horribly exposed chin. Um, so let's uh, let's bring Tom, a good friend. Um, look at that! Look at that! Oh, the shame! No, no. I can speak through my. No, there's a beard under here. Honest. <laughs> Hello, Tom. Hello, Houston. <laughs> Hello. So my question is this. I mean, we some of us have been around this block a few times already. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're saying about Web3 is stuff that Tim Berners-Lee wrote in, you know, the early 1990s, mid-1990s about what he saw, you know, reweaving the web, for instance, you know, about what he saw as Web 1.0. And he was disappointed by, and right on cue, there goes my dog, um, the um, he was he was disappointed by the fact that people didn't grasp this technology and use it. Well, for those of us who were the early pioneers, you know, you recognize the pioneers from the arrows in their back. Right. It was hard to use it, right? And so you had facilitators come along. The you know you had uh, Google come along to help you organize it. You had WordPress or other authoring tools. Ultimately, other WordPress technically is Web 2.0, but I mean, other kinds of authoring tools. I don't remember that far back. Anyway. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. you know, to help you I build it, it, you didn't have to write HTML code. You got Dreamweaver, okay? But, um, you know, at the end of the day, what happened is that people came in and wanted a simplistic on-ramp to these things. Um, and that led to ultimately Facebook and, and other Web 2.0 platforms, which made all this easier to engage with. Um, what's to stop Web3 Web from doing the same thing and then be centralized by powers that be, and now all of a sudden you're back to square one, and in 10 years we're talking about Web 4.0? It's, it's, it's a great point because one of the, one of the, the challenges in, in this space is that we have dreamers. We have incredible minds that really see the opportunity but there is a light year space between those dreamers and mass adoption. And when I look at, you know, companies like General Magic, uh, you know, inventing the iPhone or really the, the first dynamic smartphone, uh, yep. you know, was it was almost a decade before the iPhone was released. It was too mm -hmm. early and it yeah. wasn't created with humans in mind. It's that people over product, pro product over people kind of challenge. And what social media did was it, it appeared that it was putting people before the technology. It was focused on bringing meaning into the lives of people. And while I, I have major gratitude for these, these pioneers, and we have to appreciate the progression, but Web2 companies have become so powerful that they are really able to decide the destiny of the internet and mm -hmm. what is quote unquote right for the future. So I think that right now we, we are still very early for web three. I think that there are things that will happen 
uh, over the next 24 months where people will try like pets.com, everyone make a website. So now it's like, let's get everything on the blockchain. Uh, it's just an absolute waste of time and it won't yeah. actually bring value for the human beings that we are trying to support. It's putting product right. before people. And so we'll see that happen. Uh, and I'm okay with Web4 as well. Um, it, might, it might not have a 20 year span like we see from Web2 uh, to where we are right about now. But I think that it's, it's an opportunity for us to look at the ability for people to have more control only because the internet has moved to where it was. You couldn't do a Web3 uh, 5, 10, 15 years ago because you didn't have this, this viral connection of, of a global mm -hmm. society that not only could congregate, but could create on the internet. And so even from 2017 until now, when you look at you know really one of the largest moments of adoption of cryptocurrency, of blockchain, why did it crash so bad and then drag for you know basically three years? Because it didn't have enough builders, not enough application. It was still, in many cases, a pipe dream. But it was it was those dreamers trying to imagine. But right now, there are people building in these systems in really significant ways. But we do have to be conscious of not just uh, the companies, but even the investors. Uh, the creators of the Board Ape Yacht Club, the most successful NFT project to date, cool. that also bought the second and third most popular NFT project to date, just finished a seed round of $450 million that was run by, uh, by A16Z. <laughs> and so we're yeah. like, okay, Web3, decentralization, what, what does that mean? So people are struggling with that. Right. I mean, the on-ramp, again, the NFTs are a great example the most people, the people who are making money off of NFTs, really making money off of NFTs, are the brokers, who are who are providing that on ramp to people because they're like, oh, I should buy one of these, and uh, but I don't know how. Oh, well, I'll help you with that, right? And that's how you get, you know, I should I should get in this conversation that's going on in on Facebook. It's the same same story from twenty years ago. I should get in this conversation that's going on on Facebook. Oh, only college students. Oh, we'll we'll let you in. Well, come on, we'll help you with that. We'll help you get into this conversation. And, and, but that's how I'm already seeing that happening here is my point. And, um, I'm not sure. I, I really don't know how you're going to maneuver through that. Uh, or web three is going to maneuver through that because there's already a built in bias. The barriers to entry to the people who already know how to manipulate the system are as low as everybody else's and they have more resources. You're not wrong. <laughs> I am still actually myself trying to figure out how to navigate through this. But I think there are opportunities right now to look at the technology. And obviously, you need a moment like prior to Pokemon Go, it took me five minutes to explain augmented reality to people. And they still looked at me like, what are you talking about? And then Pokemon Go is like, bam, okay, there it is. That's augmented reality. You know, we're done. So NFTs. Uh, as as whatever, whatever people feel about, you know, right click, save as JPEGs, it is a very simple and visual way to demonstrate the power of smart contract technology that I'm more excited about the $100 NFT that actually just gives you something real and an and authentic utility than the idea that right now I have a NFT that's called a doodle, the top 10 NFT and they're considering building a theme park to compete against Disneyland. Now that's a huge bet. That is a crazy wild idea. Wow. But if that actually happens, so then those early adopters end up being early investors in the future of digital and in real life kind of XR mixed reality uh, entertainment. And like that might work, but then how many of those can you have? You're going to have a hundred new theme parks open. No, that's silly. So the NFT technology needs to permeate into a little bit less hype about becoming a millionaire off of a $300 JPEG you bought. But that kind of hype and craziness will, I think, usher in people being a little bit more thoughtful about, well, this technology does work. The royalties, the security, the authenticity, the transferability. So how do we just like use this in a regular way for, you know, our Costco membership and our, our library card, you know, just basic things in, 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 in our lives. Yeah. I, I got two words for you, Brian, and I'll, I'll get off your beard NFT. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, board Beard uh, NFT, perhaps, or Beard Club. Um, seriously, um, Tom, thank you for that question. And, and Michael, thank you for that very, very thoughtful answer. Um, the Costco connection, I think, is, is a nice one to, to think about. Friends, if, if you're new to the forum, uh, that's an example of a video question uh, where we just brought uh, uh, Tom up on stage. Now let me give you an example of a text question. Uh, this is from Ray Garcelon. Hello, Ray. Let me flash this on the screen for everybody. Sorry, push publish. Um, is your work signed? Oh, hang on a second. Um, I need to read this myself. Is that uh, a little too small to read? Let me just bring this up. Um, is your work aligned or associated with either of these initiatives? Tim Berners-Lee's Solid, um, or uh, that's the that's the first one that he's uh, that he's asking about. Is your work aligned with Tim Berners-Lee's Solid project? So not in a, not in an official capacity. I, I think in, in general, what's beautiful about Web3 is that people sort of like the, you know, the, the initiation of just open source collaborating in, you know, in, in software development, like people share and people are open to, you know, to uplifting others. But I, uh, I am not a, you know, an official collaborator, but if, if you're connected and you want to make an intro, please. Uh, that's uh, I'm sure that I actually haven't looked into connecting with solid so I can't point you that way but uh, 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 that's definitely a, a, a major project and of course sir Tim is one of the great uh, humans of our time um, Ray also followed it up and I'm sorry I, I missed it um, uh, with uh, asking if uh, you're also involved in the w3 C's contract for the web so that is something that we are uh, learning from when we are looking at the DAO that we're building. So the Ed3 DAO team members, uh, some of them are uh, much more involved. I don't think we have anybody on the level of a contributor, but we are constantly referencing them as, as we should. They, they have been a, a standard for education and best practice uh, for the web since really probably its inception, but I, I don't go that far back. But I, I have known them uh, since high school. So it, it's someone that we're constantly looking towards just to make sure that we we want to be able to build on this this Web3 potential. But we want to do it in a way that um, gives credence to those that came before us, but also ensures that we are building uh, as much as we might be dismantling, but making sure that we're building with the right people. That's a good general approach, I think. Um, and Ray, thank you for the excellent, excellent question. Uh, so now you've all seen how to ask a video question and how to ask a uh, text question. Now we're going to bring up another video question from our excellent friend, occasional co-host, and great CEO and great futurist. Let me bring up Maria Anderson. Hello, Maria. Hey, Brian. How are you doing? I'm good. No beard, though. Sorry. I know. I know. We'll, we'll still let you up. Okay. I'm going to come next time with a beard just to... I, I live for that. Okay. <laughs> I'm, you know, just kind of reflecting here on uh, some older technology that's, I don't actually know if I have a question, sorry. I never technically said I did, but I'm just reflecting here on some older technology and how long it took to get it into the mainstream. So the one I was thinking about in particular is QR codes. You know, like I, I first saw QR codes at a conference back in maybe 2009. And I remember bringing it back in a faculty development saying like, look, I think this is going to be really cool. It has a lot of, you know, uses. And, you know, we saw like little bits and pieces of QR codes up until three things I think happened. Uh, one, it became really hard to log into TV services. And a much easier way was to point your phone at the QR code, right? Which most people would rather do rather than typing on the little keyboard on the TV, right? To um, Venmo, everybody's got to pay each other in Venmo and it's much easier to pull up the QR code than to search, right? And then three, COVID happened and all the restaurant menus went to QR codes, right? Uh -huh. And so I, don't, I think the general population now understands QR codes and what they are and what they do with it. But they've been around for, you know, one or two decades, right? At least, maybe longer than that. I just learned about them in 2009, right? And I kind of feel like Web, th the blockchain and NFTs and the metaverse is going to have a similar slow, unless there's a, a, a black swan event, 
that really pushes it to the forefront. Like all the banks in the world fail because they weren't on blockchain or something, right? Like unless there's some kind of really major event that pushes them and, and the need for it to the forefront, I don't think we're going to see a fast adoption simply because nobody can explain in one sentence what a blockchain is, right? Or why it's useful to you. <laughs> it takes like an hour of really carefully planned pre and the average population isn't going to isn't going to listen to that, right? Like they don't they don't care, right? And then I I don't know that the NFT what we see right now in NFTs, I don't know that that's really um, uh, turning the general population to love, you know, the blockchain and, and because they're like, people are paying millions of dollars for pixels. Like that's what, that's what, you know, you feel like but most people don't have millions of dollars, millions of dollars, right? It's like a rich person thing, like waste your money on some art. Right. And so I don't, I just don't see how we're going to, shift the general population to being excited about these things. I think they'll probably start, you know, I think the back end technology will start to improve where it has to improve for security and for, you know, certain types of job applications and things like that. But I just, I don't think we're yet to a, um, what I've seen as a really clever, classy way to introduce this to the general population yet. I think it'll come, but I, I don't think it's in the next, 12 to four, 24 months, barring mm. Black Swan yeah. event. Yeah, a lot of, wow, that was like, a, that was a lot of really great insight. I'm trying to like, okay, where do I start? Because you, you said QR code, and then all I could think about as you were describing the QR code was the Coinbase commercial for the Super Bowl that was a old school DVD, you know, the thing bouncing from corner to corner, yes. and it was a QR code. And everyone was like, what in the world is this? And I was screaming at my my uh, my father, scan that right now. It caused the Coinbase app to not only crash, it brought 10 million people onto the app within yeah. one minute. And it became from like top 200 app to uh, top three app uh, yeah. within 45 seconds. So the QR code is an interesting uh, piece of technology because the way you described it was uh, the tech capacity, you know, you used to have to download a QR code app and, and then find it. the app Correct. and open it. Correct. And yeah. then it just became part of your, your camera. Now your, your camera default on your, on your phone just scans it. Then what was really the, the event that I think made it, uh, the less of the, of the sillier technologies was once again, people before product purpose. And so by being able to quickly access a menu, you just saw many more people saying, Oh, like this. This makes sense. This helps me. Is it a revolutionary piece of technology? Well, people might not appreciate that unless you're super nerdy. But in general, QR codes uh, are something that, like you said, never really quite uh, quite took off. Now, whether or not there's a you know a black swan event, I think that there's a couple things about uh, NFT specifically that uh, people have to appreciate. So the first is that when you look at Web two companies. Right. Like, um, you know, Brian Armstrong founds Coinbase. He sends Gary Tan, who's a, a venture capitalist in, 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 the, in the Bay Area, an email with one Bitcoin and says, hey, I'm doing this thing. Would you like to be a part of it? So in 10 years, his two hundred and fifty thousand dollar investment became one billion dollars. It was a direct when they went public. It was a direct listing. So they had to sell stock to create liquid liquidity. So he made a billion dollars. So 10 years, uh, $250,000 becomes $10 million, uh, uh, sorry, $1 billion. So when you look at the NFTs, you have to look at some of these projects, not all of them. So there is some hype, some FOMO, and some people that are going to carry uh, the mm -hmm. financial bag for those that are a little bit more uh, you know, financially savvy or, or even nefarious. But there are actual authentic projects like Board Apes, for example, because that's probably one that would reference a million dollar NFT sale. So most of those people were betting on the future. They were spending only eight hundred dollars for a silly JPEG of a monkey wearing a hat and smoking a cigarette with the idea that they might be able to create the next big Internet company. But no one really knew what exactly was going to happen just a year ago. And here we are 
a year later, not only are there individuals investing, there is large scale VC firms investing, there are companies investing, uh, there's companies buying NFT companies that like, like Nike and Adidas. But one of the things that is not quite true about the space that the media really portrays and what most people that are not you know, as, as obsessively uh, immersed in this as maybe someone like myself, is that there are plenty of projects right now. I just minted two that were focused on uh, women in tech uh, empowerment and funding cool. opportunities for upskilling, for training, for events, focused on women being successful in, uh, in the, in, they said Web3, but it's like being successful in tech. So my $300 could do one of two things. Uh, it could allow me to help move forward this important mission. And if I can get some sort of utility and some sort of benefit and other people want to be a part of it, maybe I'll sell one of the two that I minted. But that's a, a relatively easy entry point for people. And it has an impact. And in this case, I happen to know the creator, there is a utility. So the NFTs aren't just about buying pixels. It's about buying the opportunity to have a virtual and an in real life access and experience. So this could be access to events, conferences, networking, mastermind groups, even some actually are creating opportunities for upskilling and even job placement. So we're, we're very early. And so that means that there is silliness, there is um, mm -hmm. poor financial decisions. But I think that at the end of the day right now, mm -hmm. there is an opportunity for people to create an impact. And I'll just finish off with, I think one of the most powerful things so far that I've seen in the NFT space, which is that during this uh, war right now in Ukraine, where the banks have been destroyed, it is impossible to get fiat currency to people in need. There was a group that decided we're gonna raise funds through crypto and they raised $10 million in 45 seconds for nonprofits and organizations that were going to support the Ukrainian people. And it was delivered directly to them in less than 10 minutes. Find that happening without yeah. blockchain and without crypto in an honest and transparent way that every single dollar spent can be shown where it went to. That doesn't yeah. exist prior and, to blockchain. And I think that's a good example of, of uh, the, the, the crypto doing good. I just can't help but I don't know. Have either of you guys listened to the Crypto Queen podcast? Mm -hmm. no, I haven't. I'll take oh, a note you really, though. You really should, <laughs> because it's like the dark side of crypto and what happens if somebody, how little people understand about the actual crypto and right and and sending millions of people to download Coinbase is great and all. But having listened to the Crypto Queen, I also can't help but wonder how many people are going to also lose their shirts uh, investing in cryptos that aren't actually very solid or well, because people yeah. believe all sorts of stuff, right? 100%. Yeah. FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. You have that with yeah. penny stocks. You and, have that with in investments, yep. time immortal, right? Yeah. Investing I mean, well, in, VCs in even oil, kind of, crude oil, you know, you know there's plenty yeah. of... And there VCs will be regulation. Of their own snake oil investments, right? Yeah, there will be regulation coming uh, for better or for worse, but there there will be better. There needs to be a regulation similar to 2017 with the ICOs, right? Initial coin offerings, trying mm -hmm. to circumvent securities uh, to mm -hmm. build companies and, and and build out funding through that way. So that that not only trashed and, and really slandered the, the 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 industry and the and the technology, but it was addressed. So there will be a correction of that. Uh, in the next year or so, as the uh, IRS is for sure busy with the SEC figuring out exactly, uh, you know, how to how to both take care of some of the uh, dishonesty, but also hopefully it will protect those that do not have financial literacy and, and experience from you know, making poor decisions. So I think actually your example of the U Ukraine donations actually brings up something quite interesting, which is whether nonprofits maybe should shift to using a blockchain oriented um, donation uh to so that people can ensure that their money goes where they think it's going right i mean yeah. there's there's some sense that 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 could be the first you know we talked about qr codes and how they finally became mainstream this yeah. idea that you know where your money is going you know uh if, if only you could know where each of your tax dollars actually lands right yeah. like, you know, <laughs> my, my taxes went 100 percent to the military this year you know like I wonder how we'd feel if we could actually see every dollar we put in and where it went, right? Yeah. 
uh, that would be a, a huge step. Um, I think we may have just uh, um, found a major use for Web3 right now, even in these early days. Um, Maria, I can I can host you up here forever, but we've got a stack of questions. Thank you so much. Take me down. Thank you. Um, and uh, and Michael, thank you for uh, for that uh, short essay of, of responses. Again, I appreciate your candor and your ability to, to speak directly to this. Uh, we have a question that has been asked by about four different people, um, including by Alexis. And I want to flash it up on the screen from one person. Just, uh, but um, this is a common concern. Um, how do you respond to the issue of environmental impact of blockchain technology? That's from Hal, Hal Hepner. Um, and I, I think this is coming largely from uh, the Bitcoin mining process, which uses a tremendous amount of electricity, but also um, uh, other aspects of, of blockchain. How do you respond? How are we to how are we going to take care of this? So it's it's important to note that there are um, there are significant impacts to the environment, and anyone that says or tries to uh, really mitigate the impact, they're not being honest. But at the same time, we have to understand um, a couple different elements of what this technology uh, will hopefully uh, be able to do as it evolves. So the first thing is that the two biggest uh, blockchains, Bitcoin and Ethereum, are the uh, largest consumers of electricity and other resources. Now, there are two elements to, to this that hopefully will be resolved, but also just to be acknowledged. Number one is, is that when when we paint, you know, crypto as this, um, you know, money focused industry. So fine, but then we have to do it across the board, which means we have to assume that people are trying to make as much money as possible. So they are trying to locate in areas with much cheaper electricity per kilowatt. Well, why would electricity be cheaper in certain areas than other areas? Well, it is because there is a abundance of energy being stored in those areas. It could be from coal, but it could also be from hydro, it can be from wind, it can be from solar. And so most, and also geothermal, many right. large scale mining companies want to have uh, little to no cost associated with running their machine operation. And so they are trying to find those places, which is why there was such a large concentration in China, up to 60% of the Bitcoin blockchain was located in China. Why? Because China built these massive cities that unfortunately did not populate as they imagined they would. So they had huge solar wind and hydro um, electric uh, support that these crypto mining companies were making use of. So there isn't as much dirty energy, especially coal, as many people um, say. I mean, it really is true. And now for what I when I do engage directly in this kind of conversation, I say I won't use research from Bitcoin magazine, but you have to make sure to not use uh, resources that are more on the opposite end of the extreme. We have to come to a central common belief, which is yes, electricity is uh, being used, which is having massive impacts on the internet if it's not renewable. But where are these two large blockchains going and where is blockchain technology at large going? So <laughs> Ethereum this summer, hopefully, I mean, we keep saying this summer, we said that last summer, is moving to proof of stake, which means that it will require up to 95, some even say 98% less energy to secure and verify transactions because it no longer is using the mathematical power to stabilize the network and then keep track of the information on the network. So the network will have stabilized and they'll move to a proof of stake. Bitcoin will also move there, but it probably will take a few years, but we're not going to see this as like, well, this is gonna take 10 years. No, it won't. And the past 10 years haven't had the level of concentration that we have seen in 2017, then dropped significantly and now is back up in 2020 to 2022. So it's not like we've had 10 years of this technology wreaking havoc, but it does have impact, but it is short term when you look at between now and the future. Now, current blockchains have made these decisions and it, it, it uses a lot of electricity. New blockchains like Polygon, Solana are two large ones. They are using other types of 
ways to verify and track information that does not use as much uh, like nearly as much electricity because they learned from their predecessors. So they are being conscious. So you can see two factors here. One is we're building the future of the Internet. It's for the betterment of humanity that takes resources, but it needs to be uh, a short term impact or something needs to change. And it is now changing. And the future is, well, we're not going to do that. So there is this uh, environmental awareness in future development so that we do not continue to increase that impact. So hopefully that semi answer the question. I know that it is a, it is a big conversation. It's one that uh, I'm only partially qualified, but I do have background in, in researching this quite a bit. And I think that there's there's a happy middle ground that we all need to come to when we look at bettering humanity and taking care of our planet. Uh, well, I appreciate that. I, I personally have been hearing about proof of stake for uh, for some time. Um, uh, Jonathan Poritz quickly pushes back in the chat. He says, uh, proof of stake, if you have lots of currency units, you're more likely to win the mining task. The rich run the world. How is that a good thing? Hmm. Well, I think that there's always going to be this challenge of uh, the rich and the poor. I think what I have seen and the conversations that I've been a part of and the people that I see uh, interacting in the Web3 space is that there are more people that are from marginalized and underserved communities taking advantage of mm. the financial prosperity of crypto, where these types of individuals with uh, an amazing uh, business plan, track record, financial report could not get a bank loan in a traditional bank. They would be turned away, but they can actually fund operations, fund generational wealth and provide for not just themselves, their family, but their community through mm. crypto. So those and those are not isolated moments. I am constantly in uh, mm. audio conversations on Clubhouse and on Twitter hearing about this. There are reports and statistics that more non whites are investing in these types of technology than their white counterpart because they see it as an opportunity. But the mining has a shelf life. And we've all known that that that's been from the very beginning. So you used to be able to mine on your laptop. And then you needed a more sophisticated machine and then you needed GPUs and then you needed ASIC miners and then you needed a seven million dollar operation. So those things are uh, part of it. But there are ways even right now I, I mine crypto. There are other people that are mining crypto uh, with a slightly smaller barrier of entry. Obviously, we're not making millions, but we are moving forward technology that we are passionate about and we are being rewarded for that. But I wouldn't stop the future of the Internet because just like people during Web 2, people during Web 1, most of them who are white males made millions and sometimes billions and sometimes hundreds of billions of dollars off of this opportunity that could provide incredible opportunity to more of humanity. Well, thank you for that uh, fast answer. Uh, John has uh, some more follow-up, but we, we have other questions that are coming in about educational implications. I'll make sure we get to them. And I'm thinking, Michael, we need to bring you back just to keep going because this is so, so rich. Uh, this one question comes here from uh, uh, Devin Skerritt, who asks, what might DAOs mean for reimagining ideas of traditional faculty governance or norms breaking down students versus faculty to crowdsource teaching and learning? Oh, I love this. And Devin, I love your title. I'm a huge design thinking fan. So please, I mean, this goes for everybody. My DMs on Twitter are open. So you can privately message me, you can publicly at me on Twitter. But anyone who is interested in any of this, I'd love to connect with you all, collaborate, learn from you, share what I've learned. But I think it's, it's a really great question. So what I'm excited about with DAOs and education is I'm imagining incredible faculty. I mean, look at this room right now. It is filled with faculty that have incredible backgrounds, incredible research, talent, experience. What if we had the ability in a fast and streamlined way to decentralize the access of education between you and students the world over? Sure, we have seen this with MOOCs and online courses and Udacity and Udemy, and these were really great. Uh, I mean, I think that MOOCs probably have the, the highest percentage of not finishing uh, of any uh, you know uh, higher ed or any sort of learning opportunity to date. But imagine if you could connect with students the world over and have a classroom where you could create that impact beyond the four walls of your school and beyond just the confines of your geographic location, but in a more meaningful and collaborative way. And so when you look at DAOs and you look at the metaverse, there are ways for you to contribute to this mission of education that we're also uh, passionate about 
in ways that traditional institutions uh, cannot provide, but not at the expense of those institutions. So we still do need the centralized area for access, for mentorship, for resources, for opportunity. But I think that the Dow technology of creating an organization that can vote on, contribute, and have information and treasury tracked by the blockchain will allow us to not only um, educate in a different way, but also be uh, rewarded for that education in different ways. So I look yeah. at, I don't, I don't know what it looks like for a higher ed education as much as I see it in K-12, where educators work all day and then they have a second job because they don't have uh, the financial security uh, that is uh, that is possible by their, their single uh, the, the single position that they hold. So they end up not, they're, they're not just tutors or they're not continuing it in education. They're working at supermarkets. They are working second jobs that have nothing to do with education, but can put food on the table. So we're trying to reimagine ways in which education can be impacting other students beyond the four walls of school. Give teachers that opportunity, give professors, give educators that opportunity to connect. But how can we be rewarded as well for the work that we contribute from a research standpoint, from a curricular standpoint, from a training standpoint, and from an education standpoint. And yes, you could do that with web too, but it's centralized, which means you get a little piece of the pie and then someone is getting big pieces of the pie because that's how the centralized world works, right? The, the owner of the company gets a lot and then all of the managers, all of the fluff, all the bureaucracy, everyone needs to get paid until we finally get to the educator that really made the value that that student wants to be there uh, in the first place. So the DAO distributes that evenly and it uses the blockchain for tracking of voting, of decision making and tracking of funds to make sure that the entire system can run without the need for uh, a huge amount of bureaucratic red tape. Mm -hmm. And this is fascinating on, on, on so many levels. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm the MC here. I'm not, I'm not the chief uh, inquisitor. So I, I wanna make sure that everybody else gets a uh, a chance to uh, follow up on that. And this is a very, very rich answer. Um, we had uh, uh, other questions that are popping in and uh, I want these are the ones I want to make sure that people uh, can get to see. Um, one of them was uh, uh, thinking about, um, uh, hang on a second, I just lost it. Um, and again, friends, we have about six minutes left. So I'll make sure this is a time where you can get in your questions before uh, we have to go. Uh, Christina Setsikorn, and Christina, I hope I've got your name reasonably close, uh, asks, for educators wanting to build programs about blockchain or Web 3.0, NFT, cryptocurrencies, she asks, how would you organize, say, a five course specialization or a whole master's program? Ooh, I like that question. So the short answer is, join us. <laughs> join us in the Ed3 DAO. So you can join the Ed3 uh, educator community, uh, and I can I can share the 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 login for for that community with with Brian, so he can share it with uh, with this you know great community because that that is what we are doing right now. And while we do have some incredible uh, professors and just really strong researchers as part of our uh, initial genesis of of members, uh, we need more. We need educators that are curious and open, but that are excited to to build together because the crowdsourcing energy of web three with the credit of web three web two it's like oh let's collaborate and you know someone mm. might you know take it and run well we we have this ability to build together and the ed3 dao and the ed3 educators community uh, are both trying to materialize that uh, we are doing certification courses for educators we are building programs for schools at the k-12 level and we're eager to find partners at the higher ed level as well so that we can pilot this and really, really make this happen because it's, you know, it, it's inevitable. The question isn't if, the question is when. And I think that now is the time that we can prepare our students and show them that we are thinking about this because they are seeing this. And if it's not from us as their educators, as their trusted individuals that they know are trying to help them build their knowledge and their skill, they're going to get it from celebrities. They're going to get it from the media. They're going to get it from social media influencers. And, and many of those students lack uh, the analysis and, 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 and research capacity to make the right and informed decision. So we, it's incumbent on us. And I think that higher ed actually has the closest connection right now to the generation that's about to enter into a pretty significant Web3 moment over the next 12 to 24 months. 
Well, it's one of the reasons why we're doing a series of this here on the forum uh, and trying to get experts like you and the best thinking uh, in full conversation. Uh, and uh, and you can see that we have the full range of approaches, everything from uh, from criticism to support, from curiosity to wanting to network. Uh, that's what the forum is about. Uh, we have a, a very precise question from Armand, uh, which I'd like to uh, like to share. Uh, he asks, do you feel the scarcity of microchips now may have a long-term effect on the accessibility of, well, he adds, Internet of Things as well as Web3 blockchain in the future? So there is a shortage, 100%. Is it a long-term shortage? Um, I I hope not, and I'll I, I try to be as transparent when I when I do not know the answer to certain things, I will share it. So I am not uh, as well versed in right now the supply chain and economic impacts that not just COVID, but now even the war in Ukraine are having on just the immediate and the past two years to the next two years of shortages. What I'm hoping to see is that, uh, especially with the Internet of Things, you are not requiring uh, very complex processors to get things done. I have a, uh, a really cool Internet of Things type device that w was a little bit delayed. It was about two months delayed from uh, when I purchased it to when I received it. Uh, it is running the Helium blockchain, which is a decentralized 5G network that uses uh, this hotspot with an antenna on my roof to build our own decentralized 5G mesh. Similar to uh, the way that if you notice in, especially in, in, uh, in urban areas, Verizon and AT&T are building these ginormous uh, antennas that have a dedicated uh, meter on them. That's how much power they're using to distribute centralized 5G. What's exciting about this project is when I look at the specs, they're much lower. It doesn't need as much power to be effective. But what it's doing is it's actually going to uh, not just provide 5G to companies that will pay for the service to make the network profitable and have you know a purpose that's sustainable and viable. But we do have the opportunity because it's decentralized and it's voted on by the people for the people to actually provide internet access to underrepresented, underserved communities that even during COVID, these multi-million, multi-billion dollar communication companies couldn't figure out how to give free internet to those in most need. You mm -hmm. saw pictures of them, you know, sitting at a, a outside of a Burger King getting Wi-Fi so that they could, you know, do their schoolwork. So those levels of impact, I think, uh, are not having a problem. But high end computing uh, is being impacted by GPU shortages, by chip shortages. Uh, you need and you need chips for everything. You need chips for your refrigerator. You need chips for your cars. You need chips for your computers. So there is uh, a, a major impact. But I don't think that um, that Web3 is, is like single handedly uh, disrupting this to, to, to any anything more than a than a than a single digit percentage. But that is a um, an opinion that you can take with a grain of salt, because I, there are people that are much more uh, well versed and knowledgeable in this uh, data wise than me. But that that's my hunch. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a great question, by the way. And uh, um, and Michael, I appreciate your hedging of the uh, answer as well as the richness of the answer. Um, uh, it's it's astonishing to me that I have to say what I'm about to say now, which is that we are out of time. Um, we are at the top of the hour again, and we have somehow raced through uh, an hour of diving into Web3. Uh, Michael, uh, I appreciate your your torrent of, uh, of reflection, of ideas, uh, practical examples. You're reaching out to all of us. Um, what is the best way for us to keep up with your Web3 work? Uh, should we simply stalk you on Twitter or should, or are there other venues which are best? So Twitter for me right now is, is the greatest way to connect with me and, and to have that conversation. So as I said before, uh, my DMs are open. So if it's a question that you want to want to ask me directly and not, you know, put it on blast, but feel free to put me on blast because I think that the, the importance of the dialogue for this is less about the vacuum of this is the future and no turning back, but about really building the future of the internet together. So either way, I would love to stay connected and the, the invitation to return uh, is, is, is it would be an honor to continue these, uh, these conversations. Uh, I'm, I'm, as you probably can tell, very passionate about this, uh, this, this space. Uh, very passionate and also uh, very knowledgeable, and we, we appreciate both of those very much. Um, thank you, Michael, and we're going to follow up, But um, and thank you again for coming. But uh, don't go away, friends. Let me just point out where we're headed over the next uh, few weeks. 
if you'd like to keep talking about this, uh, all of these questions about the environmental impact, about the impact of chips, about how uh, Dow might impact a uh, faculty governance, it's all of this. Uh, Follow us on Twitter. Just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or Shindig Events, or jump over to my blog at brianalexander.org. We'd be happy to keep talking about this. Uh, if you'd like to dive into our previous sessions that we had, including one of our first sessions, as well as one we had earlier this year, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. You can find more. Uh, if you'd like to talk, look ahead a bit to our other topics, we have another Web3 session coming up next week. We have sessions on public higher ed, on paying for college, on the climate crisis. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. In the meantime, thank you all for the excellent, excellent questions. I'm really, really pleased with the wide range of views and, uh, and ideas that you all expressed. I hope that this helps takes us forward a bit more in our consideration of Web3, and we'll be following up with this with more. In the meantime, all of you, keep up all of your great work in higher education. Above all, stay safe and take care. We'll see you next week online. Bye-bye.